Hello the internet, I'm Wes, and today is a little tutorial on how to build this. It's, it's a tiny gamepad built on copper stripboard. It runs on a single coin cell battery and all the processing is done on this tiny adorable ATtiny85 microcontroller which you can swap out to play different games, of which there are several floating around the internet. It has a tiny cute screen and a tiny cute little buzzer that goes beep boop and the whole friggin thing is just so cute. Some absolute mad lads online have coded up a bunch of games for this thing, which is pretty freaking impressive considering the fact that the chip only has 8 kilobytes of memory, two of which are needed for the bootloader, so there's only 6 KB left over for the game itself. Now, of course, the games aren't AAA MMOs, but there's a lot here to admire. You got your classics like Tetris, Pac-Man, Breakout, and a bunch of others, and one absolute glutton for punishment named Lorandil even created a pseudo-3D fantasy dungeon crawler game, which is just insane to me. It looks like Fantasy Star 1 or something. So just to be clear, I didn't code these games or design the circuit. This specific platform was designed by Daniel C, aka Phoenix Bozo on GitHub, who came up with the circuit and has coded most of the games. But there are other ATtiny85 gaming platforms that have been made up by other people, which I'm not necessarily covering here. So this video isn't completely exhaustive on the ATtiny85 gaming scene. There are also additional games that were coded by other people for Daniel C's platform, so I'll be linking to them in the description as well. I'll cover as many of them as possible, but I don't know if I've rounded up everyone. So I didn't design this from the ground up, but I always try to contribute something of my own in these videos, so I'll be posting three stripboard layouts which I created in DIY LC for three versions of the gamepad. The full size version with all five buttons which can play the most games, the baby size version with three buttons that can only play the games that utilize up, down, or left, right, and fire controls, and then an alternate baby size layout for running a few additional games that were created by a fella named Andy High Number. I'll also be posting STL files on Thingiverse for the cute little 3D printed cases that I've made for all three versions of the design. I'll also provide an image for the little stickers that I use to label my games so you can print them out on sticker paper if you like. They're not fancy but they might save you some time if you want to keep track of which game is which. So the little OLED screens come in these adorable tiny clamshell cases that are perfect for storing two extra batteries and about nine game cartridges. So it's perfect that they come with that accessory and you can tote around all your extra games. If you don't want to go through the trouble of building one of these yourself, you can buy a pre-made one from Daniel C, who was kind enough to release his plans as open source even though he was building a side business around it, which is very kind. If Daniel C hadn't made this whole thing open source, I don't think I would have been able to do this little DIY project, so if you want to play adorable tiny games and you don't want to do all the soldering, consider supporting the original designer by purchasing a pre-made version of the gamepad. This tutorial is going to focus on making one of the full-size gamepads with five buttons because it can run the largest number of games. However, if you want to make one of the alternate smaller versions, just follow the diagram that I provided, use the appropriate 3D printer file, and use the exact same construction techniques that I'm going to be covering here. So before you get started ordering parts and building anything, you'll want to make sure that you have the ability to upload code to the ATtiny85 from your computer. There are a lot of ways to do it and a lot of good tutorials out there, so I'm going to gloss over the details here for the sake of runtime on this video. But in short, my preferred method is to use an Arduino Uno as the programmer with a little breakout board which connects to the pins of the ATtiny85, which allows your computer to communicate with the ATtiny chip and upload programs onto it. I like the Arduino Uno method because a lot of makers already have one laying around. They're super handy. So if you've confirmed that you have what you need to program the chips, then we're ready to get started. In terms of supplies, you're going to need the following things. Copper strip board. I highly recommend using F4. I really hate phenolic because it doesn't last. You're going to need copper hookup wire. Um, I recommend 22AWG solid core. The branding really doesn't matter. You're going to need clicky buttons. You can use any momentary button, but I'll link the ones that I used. You're going to need a piezo buzzer. Anything that can activate from 3 volts will do the trick. You'll also need two slide switches. Even just single pull, single throw is fine since they're just on off switches. Anything that fits the standard pin spacing will do the trick. You're also going to need an 8 pin dip socket to hold the game chip. Next up, you'll need a battery holder and a corresponding CR2032 battery. You can get batteries anywhere, but they're stupid expensive at the grocery store, so definitely order them online, especially if you want to have some extras. 
And of course you'll need the adorable OLED screen. It's 128 by 64 pixels of pure cuteness. I recommend getting a monocolor one, but there are some that have a section of differently colored pixels if you're into that kind of thing, but none of the games are really set up to support that, so I would probably stick with monocolor. Quite partial to the blue myself. Next up you'll need resistors with the following values. Two at 33K, two at 22K, two at 82K, and one at 10K. Optional but fun, you can get some vinyl sticker printer paper so you can print out labels for the games. It's pretty handy for knowing which one is which. And last but not least, this is again optional, but you can get some double-sided sticky stuff like a command strip or something to uh, stick into the case and then that'll help your circuit board stay down in there. Alright, in terms of tools, you'll need the following eight things. Number one, tin shears for cutting the copper strip board. You can get away with scoring it with a box cutter and snapping it on the edge of your workbench in a pinch, but I really prefer to use shears. Number two, a drill with a nice wide bit for cutting traces on the strip board. Again, a box cutter can be used here to cut the traces if you'd rather give yourself the Sir Davos special, but I really prefer a drill. Number three, a soldering iron plus solder. Number four, a fine tip sharpie marker for marking off the board. Number five, a 3D printer if you want to make the cases that I'm providing files for, although of course you can roll your own. Number six, you'll need a file or some sandpaper to smooth out any rough spots on the circuit board and on the 3D print. Number seven, you'll need basic hand tools like flush cutters, wire strippers, and maybe a set of needle nose pliers. And number eight, you'll need a basic multimeter with a continuity test mode. Okay, so we're gonna start out by preparing the copper strip board that's gonna serve as the foundation for this build. Everything will be soldered onto it. Get your board and make sure that the copper strips are oriented vertically. Then flip it back to the blank side where we're going to be making our marks with the Sharpie so that we know exactly where to cut the board and drill traces. I'm gonna start by labeling the rows alphabetically down the left side. J should land at the bottom of the board and A will of course land in the top left corner. Label the columns from 1 to 17 across the top row. I also put little lines where I intend to cut. We'll be cutting through the rows of holes rather than in between them. I'm going to take my tin shears and carefully slice along those little lines that we drew. We're cutting the row that lands above the letter A and the column to the right of 17 where 18 would have landed. Take your time and get this right or the 3D printed cases won't fit. If you cut all the way to the maximum distance that the shears can cut, you'll get these weird kind of crushed, torn spots, so I only cut about 80% of the shears maximum cutting distance. Since our shears can't reach all the way across the whole board, we'll make a corresponding cut from the other side. Once we've cut as far as the shears can take us, we're going to manually snap the board the rest of the way by pressing it against our workbench and bending it. With this much material already cut, the break should continue along the path that we've created no problem. Snap. There we go. Now we'll do the same thing on the vertical line. Cut both sides and snap the rest. Now we have a board with the same dimensions as indicated in the diagram. Congratulations. Now just grab your file and smooth out the rough edges on that board and we're ready to move on. Now I'm going to draw a circle on the board in each place where a circle is indicated in the diagram. Each of these circles represents a place where the copper strip is going to be drilled out on the back side of the board. One thing to keep in mind about the diagram is that it shows the circuit as it would be viewed from the blank side, but the copper strips are also shown on the diagram for clarity so that you can see how the signal flow is going to work, even though normally the copper strips would be hidden from your view if you're looking at it in real life from the blank side, from the top. Essentially what that means is when we flip the board over to the copper side, everything will actually be mirrored as compared to the diagram. That's why we're going to mark everything out on the blank side, which matches the diagram, and then we'll take a spare bit of wire, poke it through each of the circles that we've drawn, and make a corresponding mark on the copper clad side. That way we know exactly where to drill. So do this for every hole, and then we can start making our trace cuts. I didn't get b-roll of this, but you're just going to take the drill with a nice wide bit, pop the tip of it into one of the holes, and turn the drill just enough times to scrape away all the copper there, fully leaving a gap. You can use your multimeter with the continuity checker to make sure that the trace is fully severed. It can be easy to miss tiny lingering connections if you're only checking by eye. So once your board looks like this, we're ready to start populating the board with components. Yay! Congratulations, you're making excellent progress so far. The order doesn't matter that much, but I'm going to start by populating the board with these little clicky buttons. I'm going to straighten the leads out with some needle nose pliers to help guide them into the holes. 
These barely fit, so if you want, you can drill the holes out a little bit wider to help the buttons fit better, but I'm too lazy to do that here, so I'm just gonna smush them in there with a little bit of force. Unfortunately, the layout creator I'm using doesn't have a handy pictorial representation of the buttons, so I've indicated them with some blank white boxes. The main thing is that you want to get the pins in the correct columns and orient the buttons so that when they're pressed, they're connecting the vertical columns to each other. You don't want them sideways so that they're just connecting top to bottom, which already have continuity in this version of the circuit. So for example, the leftmost button should connect column 1 to column 3, etc. You can see where the edges of the boxes land in the diagram or just zoom in on any of this footage. You can test with the multimeter to make sure everything's going where it's supposed to. If the buttons are oriented sideways, they won't work right. Once all five buttons are in place, let's populate the other components. We'll pop the switches in where they need to go, one for power to the circuit and one that toggles the buzzer on and off. Next, let's place that piezo buzzer. The buzzer is polarized, so make sure that you have it facing the proper direction. Just bend the leads out a bit so it stays put. Next, pop in that 8-pin dip socket with the notch facing to the left and bend those leads. Now you can see the circuit is starting to take shape. Next up, let's place all the jumper wires that you see sprinkled around the diagram. We're going to grab different colors, cut them to size, and pop them in. I like red for power, black for ground, and random colors for everything else, but hey, this is your project. Make it look however you want. For the super short connections, I usually just take a strip of wire and strip it completely bare and then bend it into a U shape. If there's a really small short jumper that's crowded too close in with other stuff, you can do the jumper completely on the copper side and just skip the blank side altogether. Next, we're going to place our resistors. The ones that are spaced really tightly can be stood up on one end to make the whole thing a bit more compact. Check this out. Yeah, like that. Make sure the values are right or the button presses can get all scrambled and the microcontroller won't know which button is being pressed. Now is a good time to double check your work so far because we're about to squeeze in the battery harness and the OLED screen, which can get in the way of certain corrections later on if you need to make them. The screen especially is going to be difficult to replace if something goes wrong, so make sure you got it right the first time. The screen and the battery harness will rub up against each other a bit, so make sure they fit in place with each other and that the whole thing fits in the case. You may need to shimmy things around slightly. The reason why I made this circuit so crowded is because one piece of the strip board that I'm linking you to can be cut into four sections and make two full-size game pads and two minis without wasting any excess. The boards are kind of expensive, they're like 10 or 11 bucks a whack, but getting four projects out of it makes the blow to your wallet a little easier to justify. I know it seems excessive, but honestly getting a high quality board to build everything on really does pay for itself in reliability and lack of hassle. Once everything's looking good, it's time to solder everything up. I like to use these little tilty vice thingies, but you can use whatever method suits you. Just make sure it's nice and steady. This part is pretty simple. You see some metal poking through, you solder it down, you clip the excess. Easy peasy. I save the screen for last and make sure to get it in there really carefully. Do your best to keep the bottom of the board nice and neat so that it sits flush into the case when you put it in there. So now at this point you should have a fully working game system. Congratulations! Pop in the battery and hope that no magic smoke comes out. Most of the time these coin cell projects are pretty forgiving on that front so don't be too scared. Pop in a game and make sure that the directional indicator on the chip is facing to the left, oriented the same as the little directional indicator notch in the socket that you put down. I label my games so that the right side up text means that you're in the correct orientation. This is definitely the most intuitive way to do it. I recommend doing your first test with a game that uses all of the available buttons, like Missile Command, which smacks by the way, it's a great game. Test out every button and make sure it does exactly what you expect and nothing else. Don't be ashamed if one of the buttons is missing a connection or something, it's definitely happened to me. Just sit down, double check everything against the diagram and do a bit of troubleshooting. You probably just missed a jumper wire somewhere, which actually did happen to me on this build. Once it's all confirmed working, I'm just going to cut four little squares of some sticky stuff and plop it into the corners of the case. I'll put the board down in there and use a handy little implement to push the corners down with some gentle but firm pressure. The friction fit is going to be the main force holding everything in place, so no need to worry if the adhesive isn't crazy strong. It's mostly just there to put some mushy padding in and a bit of grip. 
Congratulations, you made tiny adorable video games. I'll provide a link to all the GitHub pages where you can download the game code which actually goes on the chips. It's all available for free. I initially built these in early December so I could make a splash at some various work and friend group holiday gift exchange parties, and I gotta say, I feel like it worked. And people really seemed to like them, and the gamepads were like amongst the most stolen and swapped and sought after gifts, and that made me feel awesome. Even regular civilians, that is to say non-nerdy maker types, thought that they were cool, and that's pretty much my gold standard for the success of a fiddly hobby project. It's really easy to find yourself sequestered off in your little dungeon when you're working on something like this, so any project that that actually helps you connect with people instead of turning into Gollum in your basement is a win in my book. Now, I will be honest, I initially had kind of a lot of trouble getting some of the code to compile, so I highly recommend using the pre-compiled hex files provided by Yevgeny Oleksandrenko, who I will link to in the description. I believe Yevgeny also sells a version of the hardware as well. Using an already compiled hex file means that you can skip collecting up libraries and dealing with all the compiling errors and stuff like that. You will still need Arduino IDE to put the bootloader on the chip, but then you can just use AVR Dude to put the hex files for the game straight onto the chip, no fuss, no muss. I'm not too clever with the command line and AVR Dude makes use of the command line, so I ended up using a program called AVR Dude S to get the job done. AVR Dude S adds a graphical interface to AVR Dude, so you can just select all your options from a drop down menu and click the button that says upload program or whatever, instead of having to like type out a bunch of command line stuff, which was really handy for a novice like me. I won't sugarcoat it, there are some fiddly steps with the programming, but once you have it set up it takes like 2 seconds per game and you can get the build time on the circuit itself down to like 2 hours. So with about an hour of 3D printing time if you're going coarse and fast, you can really crank these things out. I think I've made about 8 of them at this point which is crazy, I gave most of them away as gifts and I'm keeping a couple for myself. but. Uh, Suffice it to say, after I finish uploading this video, I'm never touching this project again. There's a lot of really amazing games, but I gotta say, I keep coming back to Moonlander by Tsha70. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. T-S-C-H-A-70 on GitHub. It has this really cool retro future looking UI and a really satisfying little physics system. Uh, it's got some really fun levels and it's challenging but doable. And if it takes me a year or the rest of my freaking life, someday I'm gonna find out what's at the end of the tiny dungeon. <laughs> I might do a review of all the games just for giggles, because I think Video Game Critic for games that run on an ATtiny85 is a hilarious niche that must be filled. The invisible hand of the market has spoken, <laughs> uh, but seriously. Anyway, feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see more hobby electronics project stuff, including a lot of music tech stuff and a lot of DIY synthesizer builds. Uh, feel free to leave a comment about things you're interested in seeing or ways that I can make the format more entertaining. I'd definitely like to be able to improve on this. Anyway, my name is Wesley. Thank you so much for watching. Cheers. See you next time.